Welcome to the Painter Marketing Mastermind Podcast, a show created to help painting company owners build a thriving painting business that does well over $1 million in annual revenue. I'm your host, Brandon Pierpont, founder of Painter Marketing Pros and creator of the popular PCA educational series, Learn, Do, Grow, Marketing for Painters. In each episode, I'll be sharing proven tips, strategies, and processes from leading experts in the industry on how they found success in their painting business. We will be interviewing owners of the most successful painting companies in North America and learning from their experiences. In this episode of the Industry Partner Series of the Painter Marketing Mastermind Podcast, we host guest Danny Kerr. Danny is the co-founder of Breakthrough Academy, a training development company specifically designed for contractors. Listen on as Dandy describes the mechanics of how an effective contracting business works and how to set your company up to scale both efficiently and profitably. What's up, Danny? Hey, man. How's it going? Doing great, man. Doing great. You and I spent some good time together at Contractor Reboot in Seattle. Yeah, that was awesome. You and your wife were... uh... Some of my favorite conversations late into the I night. Had a good time. It got a little bit weird, but that's what makes for good conversation. You make that sound terrible. It was we good. Had, it was we good. We were talking about the conspiracy theories of the world. We, we did. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. We should probably probably clarify what I mean by weird. <laughs> Otherwise, it could be even worse. Just, you know, there the assumptions. <laughs> uh, and then the uh, try to make some bad decisions. You had a good friend come in town, which was very good. Uh, yep. So then you you made bad decisions with that friend, which was good. Yeah, <laughs> but it was fun, man. I enjoyed I enjoyed hanging out with you. And while we were there, we we talked about getting on a podcast together. Hence today. Yeah, thanks for having me. That's good. Yeah, man. So we we, we both presented at Contractor Reboot. Uh, you dove really really deep into what makes a uh, a successful contracting business. You know the nuts and bolts of it. So I'd love to I'd love to get into some of your uh, background. First, kind of how you got into to BTA, how that whole thing came to be, maybe what BTA is, and then we'll we'll just kind of dive ra- down rabbit holes as we go. Let's do it. Let's do it. So what is your background? So you want to start there? Um, yeah. So I, I I did start in painting. So you know that's uh, it's kind of interesting being where I am now because looking back, even being in painting was random for me. But it was I was 18 years old, looking for you know a job in university while I was going to school, and um, saw that sign that a lot of young kids see called college pro painters and said make 15 grand this summer and i remember being drawn into that i was like i need 15 grand this summer i got a lot who doesn't i got a lot of bills to pay so <clears throat> thought i was applying for a painting position um found out it was for a student franchise um role and you know over a course of a few interviews ended up starting a little small painting company so when i was 18 that was kind of my summers uh, 18 19 and part of my 20s and um really started to see the difference between what I thought was going to be my success path, which was school, which to be honest, I really struggled with. I'm hyper dyslexic and reading and writing is not my forte and university demands a lot of that and starting to see myself excel in this little business I'm running. Right. So I've got this little painting company, six employees, kind of just, you know, every, every year book and work through the off season, producing it during the summer when I was off university and, um, kind of fell in love with it and realized that like I am much more of an entrepreneur than an employee and I need to explore this more. So um, left university after my second year and went into full time to work for College Pro Corporate and went from being a franchisee with them to being a franchisor. So I hired and trained my own franchisees, moved to the cold city of Edmonton, Alberta, which I do not recommend. (laughs) It's a good experience to be there, but uh, a little different than British Columbia. And um, Kind of found my niche, 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 whatever my thing. I like niche. I think it sounds very, uh, a little pretentious, but maybe that's why I say it. I like niche. There you go. So <laughs> it was, you know, and really what it was, was not only was it being an entrepreneur, but it was teaching entrepreneurship. So now I had all these young, you know, students who I had hired and basically were training to run their own small painting company. And it, I just fell in love with it. I, I fell in love with the challenge. I fell in love with the camaraderie it brought. I fell in love with being able to bring value and, my whole family is actually teachers. So it was nice to be able to be a teacher again, but in the world of business that I just learned. And um, yeah, I spent all in with College Pro almost eight years there. And um, really in my own way, it was kind of my education. I said, well, if I'm not going to get a degree, this will be my education. So um, it was nice. I got paid to do it, but I also learned how to run a business. So 
that was the early part of my 20s and brought me to a place where I realized at some point, although this gig with College Pro is amazing, I do need to create my own thing. And I remember we had a Dragon's Den event. Uh, I can't remember what year it was now, but um, everyone in the company came together and we went over like, how do you take the concept of College Pro painters and create more businesses out of it? And so everyone was pitching, you know, College Pro window cleaning, College Pro lawn care, College Pro moving services, different services that you can apply to the same franchise-esque model. And I remember going up there and just saying like, if I'm very honest, like, I think we suck as a painting company. Uh, <laughs> we're, not, That's honest. we're not that good at it. But what we are world class at is training young people to run these small businesses. And I think that we have a business model within that, that we could take what we do and basically create a school for entrepreneurs. Um, they didn't go with it, but I remember sticking with that idea in my own mind. And when I left, that's all I could think about is I was like, I have to create this school, whatever this thing is. And so took a couple more years working with another uh, um, executive uh, consulting company and learned about their world and actually if anything learned about how much more i knew than i thought i was 26 i think when i started with them and by the time i was 28 i i started bta and it was kind of this like i'm young but to be honest i i i have to do this it's been like almost tearing me apart emotionally to not to ignore this idea um and it's been a bit of a ride ever since so breakthrough academy started in 2015 we you know, had 12 members, I think, our first year. We're up to 618 companies we actively work with now. And over the last eight, nine years, we've not only you know realized a lot of our potential, what we can achieve, but it's I've learned a lot just from working with all these different businesses and seeing the patterns that exist in all these contracting companies and taking not only my experience of what I have, but really bringing the groups together where we can solve business for contracting. Um, so now we've got a pretty tight program. We've got 47 staff working for us and yeah, that idea, that dream that was bugging me for so long, I now understand why it's like, this was what I was supposed to do. Um, I had no idea, but it took uh, a lot of years of just sweat, blood and tears and figuring it out. And now we're here. So yeah, that's what a cool bit of the story path. of how we came to be. What a cool path, man. So you have 618 companies now. Yeah. Yeah. I go what to the fluctuates is... every week, right? There's, but yeah, sure. that is where we're at. Currently. Sure. So. What is your just general split, let's say between painting companies and other businesses? In the beginning, I would say painting was probably about 30, 35% of our overall portfolio. It is probably now around 20, say 18 to 20. Um, just marketing the way we have over the years, we've definitely got a lot into construction, uh, a lot into roofing, landscaping, um, sub trades. So yeah, it used to be our biggest one. It's now not. And I think it's just come down to the need and all these different areas of business that we just get pulled into and you just put your marketing dollars online, you build some relationships and suddenly before you know it, you've got people in another world. So, and sure. I'll say this too, like I don't do any of the active coaching anymore and we've hired some really expert coaches that have expertise in other, other industries. And that's kind of where we've ended up. But yeah, painting still, it's a part of what we do, but it's not the main one like it used to be. Sure. So we were talking before we started recording here and you mentioned you guys just finished your winter summit. Mm -hmm. Is that right? How many summits do you guys do a year? We do one summit a year, so it's kind of the the big crescendo to everything yeah. we do. But all the members spend December getting their strategic plans ready, so we have a very tight process for that. And they review. We put them in groups of five when they're there, so they review each other's uh, strat plans before they go into the entire event. And then we kind of couple it with you know, an awards night, a keynote speaker. We have a full day of strategic planning where they're all in their groups, and then we do like an adventure activity. You know, snowshoeing, snowmobiling, dog sled races, ice climbing, all kinds of different stuff. So we were in Bend, Oregon this year and yeah, had a really awesome crew there. Not only our members, but it's some of our members' wives were there as well. And get to kind of see the impact, right? You know, spend a lot of time behind the laptop doing what we do. Um, it was, it was, it's a good refresh for like reminding you why you do what you do. And um, I had a, obviously a great time up till three in the morning, some nights and hanging with good people. So, yeah. That's super cool. Yeah. And you were, you were talking about that impact before we officially started that and the reward of, of seeing it because you can get so focused on your business and helping people, but really into the logistics and the math and what you're actually doing, you, you kind of fail to always appreciate the impact that you're having. Totally. Yeah. Both just like in the family life and the personal side and the numbers are neat. I mean, we had two billion dollars that these guys all produced wow. these guys and girls all produced in the last fiscal year and average profit increase was 42 percent. so we always pull those numbers as kind of like an annual wow. review and 
just standing in front of all those people, meeting them, knowing their lives and the impact it's made. I'm like, this is getting kind of crazy. You know, this was an That's idea in my basement and it's now turning into this solution that kind of undeniable. And like, even for myself, I'm a little beside myself. I don't have, know how to fully take that in, but I'm like, again, I'm meant to do this. I'm glad I'm here. This is really yeah. neat. So God bless, man. That's amazing. So you, so 42%, I just want to make sure everyone is super clear on this. You're saying it's a 42% average profit mm -hmm. increase. So basically for every $2 of profit that they were making before, they're now making close to $3 on average. Uh, I think about this way. If they made say a hundred dollars, they would make $142 the next year. That's amazing. Yeah. At the same revenue level. Uh, some of the revenue will go up too. So like revenue goes revenue up would go up by about 20, 30%. I think it was 26% was the average revenue increase net profit at 42. So we see revenue climb, but when we see profit increase even more than revenue, we know we're, we're acting on those efficiencies in the right way. Love it. Making the business more efficient. Yeah. Revenue is vanity. Profit is sanity, right? Yeah. Yeah. So let's, I think it's absolutely a wonderful thing BTA does. I think there are so many people in the trades who maybe don't have a, a professional business background. They, they might've, um, you know, painting, especially they might've fell, fell into it, right. Or they've just done it for a long time or their dad did or, or whatnot. What are some of the biggest mistakes that you see contractors make? You know, some of the patterns you've seen that you've been able to help people with at BTA. When the overarching principle or theme is like they see it as a as a their painters, they don't see it as their business owners or entrepreneurs, right? So that's like the beginning of all of it. It's like which way do you see yourself? Because if you see yourself as the world's best painter, that's all you'll ever be, and that's amazing. Some people that's all they ever want to be, so that's totally fine. But some people are trying to run a business through being the world's best painter and that you can't, you can't do that. You know, you, it doesn't work. So a lot of the stuff that has to be early, early worked on um, is the numbers, is the financials, the sales, the, the, the production, you know, metrics. There's the game is won and lost in those numbers and you can work as hard as you want. You can hire as many people as you want. You can have the best vision ever. But if you don't understand how to make profit on jobs, you don't understand how to you know increase productivity per labor hour, if you don't understand how many leads it takes to get a sale, and you can't, even if you know that, you can't project that out by a year, track back weekly and see where you're at, goal versus actual, you can't influence behavior, let alone your own behavior, let alone the, your team's behavior, right? Like people need to see and understand where do I apply energy and effort this week? And if it's always on a gut, I think, I do think gut gets people to like, you could probably do a million dollar painting company and be pretty good just running it from your gut. But I think beyond that, you're playing a pretty risky game. And I see a lot of people start to falter after that. I want to dive into this concept of, you know, can't build a, a business, a sustainable business, maybe to the scale that, that you guys are looking at. If you're focused just on being the world's best painter. You know, I think that mindset of not really focusing on the widget per se, but the business of, you know, manufacturing, selling the widget Let's, let's go into that. Cause I don't think that's always super clear to people. You know, they might be listening. They might say, what, well, Danny, you have to produce a great paint, you have to produce a quality project. So can we dive into what you mean by that? Yeah. I mean, I think when it comes to your product or your project work that you do, it has to be consistent with your brand, right? So people are hiring you expecting a certain level of quality and service. And all of you have a different level of that. I mean, I've met so many different people. Some people are specialized in the highest end niches of, you know, the world's billionaires that they paint for. Like literally we have some clients that that's, that's who their clients are. And like, you better believe they charge for it. Their brand represents it. The people they hire and the expertise required is very niche. Um, and then you've got all the way down to your average, just residential repaint college pro painter kid. That's, you know, out there doing his thing, which is where I started. And our brand represented a certain level of quality and experience. And our job was to maintain that. Right. Um, absolutely. So Whatever that is for each individual person, I think that is vitally important. If you get away from that and you just focus on business and you say, whatever, the product can be completely crap because we'll just make as much money as we can. You'll last one or two years and you'll go out of business for sure. Sure. Um, but it's not about more than trying to like maintain what is what your brand represents. And that's not as difficult as people think. I mean, some people think there's no way projects can get produced without me. But if you look around yourself and see almost any business that's scaled up over the years or large, you know, fortune 500 companies and everything in between small business, medium business, people have figured it out. <clears throat> it is not impossible. And a lot of it comes down to reallocation of your time. So being willing to pull away from the job sites a bit and being able to take time on other things like learning 
high level recruiting and onboarding and interviewing and building standard procedures to enable a structure for people to enter and hold up the brand. And I think there's a bit of stubborn pride and ego too, where it's like, you don't want to feel useless. You don't want to feel like you're not needed. And so you make yourself needed by filling your time with stuff, sure. which is not serving you long-term. Yeah. Don't mistake activity for achievement. So this idea that you can get to a certain level yourself, you know, driving it as the business owner, maybe you are a master craftsman or, you know, passionate about it and you grow to a certain level. But then if you want to go beyond that, this idea, well, no one's going to be able to estimate and sell the way I can. Well, no one's going to be able to manage a project I can. Or maybe if you're earlier, earlier on, no one's going to be able to paint like I can. But you have to decide, are you, are you wanting to grow a business as a business owner? Are you wanting to stay in that particular role? And if you want to grow as a business owner, you probably need to develop a new skill set because it's something you haven't done before. I think that's something you spoke about at yeah. Contract Review. I'd love to to kind of dive into this leveling up or shifting of skill sets. Sure. Yeah, I mean, it's, so when I see it with our members, like, let's say this, I have, you know, a painting contractor comes in, I have very difficult people to hire for because our projects are so complicated. I need people that are so specifically trained that I could never step away from the job site, right? I hear that decently often actually. And I'm like, okay, so there's actually two skill sets that you really need to hone in on to get this right. The first one's recruiting. So we're going to have to be able to open up the net and put more than the three hours a week into recruiting that you're currently doing, potentially put 20 hours a week into it for the next six months sure. even just to really, and there's a skill to that. There's a skill to knowing how to generate applications, how to build ideal candidate profiles, how to drop ad copy properly, how to pre-screen people, how to ask good questions in the interview, how to ultimately like be a good recruiter and interviewer and, and onboarder people. And then the other half is we need to take what's in your brain, what you know so well, and we need to document it in a repeatable way. And if there are sometimes things, and it's never perfect, so like there are things sometimes where you realize this is not a replicable way of doing things, but I do want to grow this as a business, we need to pick a part of your product and service offering that is replicable, right? So if you're only doing high gloss, you know, whatever, mirror finish, you know, doors, and that's your thing. And it's like, it's, it's not repeatable because it's a craft you honed for 20 years. It's like, okay, that, that can be an issue. <laughs> I'm not going to lie. But <laughs> what else do you no. do? Right. It's like, what are the other things that you could put people on, on sites on that could repeat over time? And generally, I mean, painting, if I look at it, is not the most complicated contracting trade I work with. Right. You look at some of the builders we work with, some of the custom homes that, that, that they're doing and the design work involved, the engineering involved, and the, all the things that go into it. I can assure you painting, if anything, is one of the more repeatable industries that we work with and has it actually to its advantage. Yeah. So the, the mental shift from being a, an artisan or really focusing on the painting to being a business owner and understanding the skill set and accepting that and kind of embracing that. Are there any other roadblocks or big mental shifts? I mean, that's a pretty massive one. But well, any other big mental shifts you see? Yeah. And, and I mean, I was, everyone's going to be listening to this who's from coming from different walks of life. Like I'll say this, you don't have to do that. No one's forcing you. We do need good craftsmen. We're like some of the people I hire to work on my home are just single entrepreneurs and they're amazing. And yeah. I'm so glad that they're here to do the work they're doing because I couldn't find anyone else to do it. Um, not to that level anyways. So you, it's just like, it comes from passion. Like you have to want it and you can't just say, well, I want to make more money. That's not passion. Like there has to be a reason you want to create something you're excited by leading people. You want a brand that's recognized. It has something to do with you. And if you're excited by that idea and it gets you up in the morning, it's a good sign. But if it, you dread it and you're just like, I just want to make maybe 20 or 30 grand more, there's other ways to do that and to keep it still small and to keep it around you. And that's totally cool. So make sure it's like your choice, not something yeah. that you just saw at a conference, got inspired and felt, well, everyone else is growing their company, MSI, better eye. It's like, it's okay. Craftsmen are still highly valued in this industry and we need them. So, yep. Yeah. And comparison is the thief of joy. And when people are, are speaking at conferences, I was actually talking with someone about this today. They're not always being a hundred percent transparent, right? Sometimes they're actually outright lying. So if you feel like you're at, at conferences or you're at events and you feel like you're the least successful person there, recognize that sometimes people are showboating or saying things that are maybe not a hundred percent accurate. So don't, don't necessarily feel that way. The, uh, I want to parlay from that into something you mentioned at Contractor Reboot, because I think this, it ties very nicely into the idea of you having a strong why, you know, you, you needing it to be tied to something other than just, Hey, I want to make money. You talked about how you 
used to be called Danny, Danny Octane. That's what they referred right. to you as, right? Cause you yep. would just drive. Yep. And then eventually you realized, even though you're so passionate about this, there's still a limit to how hard and long a human being can drive before you start to suffer from burnout. Totally. Let, let's talk about burnout. Sure. I mean, I wish I was a good example for like having seen it ahead of time and been proactive, but it's it, a lot of my examples are reactive to the point where I have to change. Um, Impulsive entrepreneur. Yeah, I'm just obsessive. I just kind of love it. So, <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, I don't know. Like, I, I mean, okay. So, like, you know, college pro first year franchisee, 80 hours a week, like literally 80 hours a week, maybe more. Um, hit the end of the summer. I had made good money, you know, as an 18 year old kid, I think I'd made 10 grand a month profit and I'd saved almost all of it. Cause I lived at home at the time. It was great. So That's I had awesome. 40 grand sitting in my account for the four months of summer did good, but I was so exhausted. I was like, I am not meant to be an entrepreneur, not because it wasn't a great ride that I did well at in lots of ways. I have to work so bloody hard for it to work. I shouldn't do this. And I did some, you know, Basically, went, went and did a bit a very different thing after that. I went and flew helicopters. So I went and took the $40,000 I'd made, put it in helicopter school, spent six months learning to fly choppers. And it was the strangest thing ever because I was awesome. more depressed. It was, And everyone says that to me. And I, and I guess it around, wasn't awesome. Flying choppers was cool. But like it was one hour every two days plus ground school for an hour, maybe every other day. Like I'm like going from 80 hours a week to like seven. And I was so underwhelmed. I was lethargic. I was, I was more depressed working too little, like being underwhelmed than I was being overwhelmed. And it was a very interesting feeling for me where I was like, huh, like it is actually okay to work hard and be busy and be like a driver. Um, maybe not to the level I did it, but like, you know, this is still who I am. I need to go do this. And as cool as helicopter school sounds like it actually made me almost depressed. Um, cause I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing. So now you ruined it. Now you yeah. want to it. <laughs> so I will say this. So my second year, I was 20, 19 now, so I'm still pretty young, but I remember going back, my girlfriend at the time, my now wife, so she stayed with me since I was 16, actually, thank God. Um, but I remember making one promise to her. I said, look, um, I will go back and do this again, but I promise I won't suck at my job as much as I, because she always used to say that. She's like, man, you like, it's great and all you did this, but you kind of suck at your job. <laughs> she was, honestly, brutal honesty. That's what she said to me. And, uh, and I was like, I won't suck at my job. And here's the one thing I will do differently. I'm going to hire a project manager to manage a lot of the day-to-day -day side. And so that the phone that's ringing goes to that person and not me. So I made one small change. And I went from working 80 hours a week down to, I'd say, probably 60. Now, a lot of people would say, that's, that's, um, that's not super sustainable. That's a lot of work. It was required. I was young. I needed to do a startup. I was into it. I liked doing that. It felt more, more balanced for me anyways. And um, a change had to be made because I drew myself to complete exhaustion. But the opposite wasn't better. Like just, just sitting back and working six hours a week, seven hours a week was terrible too. Or even the idea of having a job like kind of tore me apart a little bit. So so I made that little adjustment. And I will say, you know, I've been an entrepreneur now since I was 18. So what am I, 20, 37? So yeah, almost 20 years, 19 years. And there's times through that entire 19 years, even just a couple of years ago, where I overwork myself, I overburden myself. I have to evaluate what's going on, see where it's getting in my way and make one or two small tweaks. Um, my default is to be a hardworking dude. Like just kind of, I'm a workaholic. That's how I am. I know that about myself. I don't hate that about myself. I don't try and hide that. I don't wish it away. I enjoy it, but I do need to, and, and I'm getting better as I'm getting older, recognize when it's enough's enough and start to like put one or two changes in place to create some balance. And I'll, I'll end with this. Balance isn't about what you do week in, week out, although sometimes it can be. Balance can sometimes be, and I've done this a lot in my life, these next four months are our go season. I'm, there's no balance. Good luck. But the four months after that, I promise I'll we'll go on this family vacation. I'll be home for dinner because it's our off season. And like, and I'm good with that. So yeah, people, people as entrepreneurs, I think all struggle with this. I don't think I'm unique to this. Most of us do, especially the ones that are really passionate about what they do. Um, and just know that it's okay. It's not okay forever though, because you will eventually get exhausted. Um, and sometimes balance is, is over the course of 12 months. It's not every day having, you know, everything look perfect in your block scheduled calendar. I do grind during high season and then I make sure I have scheduled space to get away in our off season. I think that's great. I think knowing that it's okay to have a different schedule, we don't have to 
hey, you have to take every weekend off or make sure you take one one full day off a week or, or that you eat dinner with your family every night. Obviously, these things are ideal, but there might be go go times or there might be times in the development or growth of your business, especially early on, where that's just not feasible. If you do it, you might not get to where you're going. Sometimes putting your head down, hey, I'm going to sprint for a second here, and then I'm going to I'm going to consciously not let that continue. I'm going to consciously pull back at this certain time. Yeah. And to even play devil's advocate to what I just said, don't allow that to be your excuse. So that's what you're always doing. To be, and it's to always be kind a of dumb mistake. And you're always one month away from having some time away. Like yep. schedule it, pay for the trip. Oh, we have to go on a vacation for it's a done. week and a half in whatever, November 10th. And it's already paid for. So I guess that's what we're doing. Right. And then I have made a commitment that like, I will not work weekends as of these dates. And like, I've already got scheduled things for those things. Um, so force it on yourself and, and you will find you're, you're going to be okay, but, um, it takes discipline and it takes commitment to actually doing it. I, my biggest thing is I just schedule things and pay for them. <laughs> Once they're paid for, yep. I have to go do them. And I do find after a good vacation, I'm able to like re reset a little bit, then just keep yep. going, going with the same weekly routine. So yeah, it's nuts. I've found that there are times when I have to pull back or my wife pulls me back. Yeah. And I don't want, you know, it's kind of kicking and screaming like, no, I have to do it. I have to do it. And then you come back and it's like, wow, I was, I'm pretty happy I did that because now I just thought of a totally different way to do this. And it's much smarter. Yeah. hundred percent. The, uh, so you said you have to know when enough is enough. You and I are, are pretty similar in the hard charging. Hey, you know, if there's something to be done, great. Just roll up your sleeves and, you know, we'll just plow through and get it done. How do you know? Because there's so much celebration of hard work right? There's in the media and, and entrepreneurs and Hey, you, you yeah. have to go through hell, go through the ring of fire. There's so much celebration of that and sort of idolization of that. How do you know where the line is? Like, Hey, you do have to work hard as an entrepreneur. It's a tough venture versus, you know, Hey, you're probably over the edge. I ask people around you. You're, you're probably not going to be your own best barometer because your perception of reality is probably quite skewed to everyone else around you. Sure. Don't be afraid to ask, ask your friends, ask your family, ask the people you trust and know. Um, and don't be afraid of their answers because they're probably not going to be exactly what you want to hear. So, um, yeah, my wife has been a really big part of this, right? She is my barometer and I know when she's mad at me and instead of ignoring that and trying to just smooth it over, I ask her like, how are you feeling? How am I doing with supporting you? How am I doing with showing up? And she'll give it to me pretty straight. And I'm like, okay, I hear you. Like I will do something about this. Um, yeah. One good thing about being a person of action, which people that work too much often are, if you make a commitment, you can also action yourself into that, which I action myself into time with my family. And I kind of know it's already an issue by asking and bringing it out into the open. I'm forced to contend with it and I'm happy to. I'd rather have good communication around it than just ignore it and kick it down, kick the hand down the road. So yeah, can't. Can't really ask. She says, yes, it's a problem. Okay, great. I'm going to continue to do yeah, it. Yeah. I'm just a really big jerk. <laughs> yeah. At that point, you're kind of, so, kind of committed. The, uh, so let's talk about so, sort of delegating. I'll, I'll say from my experience, you know, in the beginning, it's do everything on your own because you kind of have to, you know, jack of all trades, learn it all. You should know your business well. And then as you grow, I started delegating things that I didn't like or that I felt that I wasn't the best at. And uh, as you continue to grow, it became to me, okay, if there's, my barometer was, is this a task? Is this a task that I'm doing over and over and over again that doesn't need me? This podcast needs me. There's no one for me to easily replace here. I enjoy the podcast. I like the connections. I'm going to continue to do it. It's a little bit like a task, but it's a high value task that I'm, I'm especially well suited for and that I enjoy. Then there are other tasks where I find, okay, I'm doing it over and over again. How the heck do I stop doing this? Is that one of the things, is that a barometer you use? Yeah, what you're speaking to. So yeah, these are more tactical things. So we're just talking philosophy, but if you want to talk tactical. Yeah. So um, one really valuable thing everyone should do every year, it's kind of what you're speaking to, is do an annual audit of your job. So mm -hmm. I'll do an annual audit of my job and usually my team's job as well, team's jobs as well. But at the bare minimum, annually audit your job. And what you're doing is you're writing down all the things that you do, right? And then you're circling stuff that's high time consumption, but low skill. And that's usually the first stuff to choose to delegate. And there's many ways to delegate things. You can hire someone else to take on that role because there's enough of it. You can delegate it down to an existing person, obviously on your team. You can potentially systemize it. So it's not even like needed anymore. So it's just a part of a system or like part of that systemization thought is like 
you could find technology to potentially do it. There's so many things that, especially repetitive things that feel over and over again happening. Like there's probably something out there that does that. Now, if it's more manual, like I remember one was like picking up paint and dropping off ladders. Right. And I was like, well, like I know where the addresses are and I know all the customers and I know all the specific specs of what everyone expects and needs. So like, let me just take care of this. And this was early in my painting career, but like, I remember I was talking to the paint store about their delivery system and how they work and how they cost a little bit more money, but how it can be worth it and how all they need to know is by 12 o'clock the day before what my order is. And then they can actually have it on the site ready to go first thing in the morning. And I was like, oh, so like, I just have a, have a, have to have a process with my production team where by 12, they call in and make an order and they have to be aware of that. And if they're not calling me by 12, guess who has to drive to the paint store themselves and get paint them. The expectation is set. It's in their agreement. It's been discussed in training. Now we can go do that. Danny Kerr doesn't have to do paint anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Other little things where I was, I was kind of cheap. I was like, I had one production vehicle. I had the only ladder racks. I'll move all the ladders myself. I want to save money. <laughs> <laughs> um, gave up on that. Got some more production vehicles. Got some more ladder racks. Made sure each crew had their own dedicated vehicle and completely stopped me from being a have to having to be at sites every single morning and trying to rush to get everybody going increased productivity of all my crews gave me more time to go book more work and gave me ultimately a space to actually create my business around me. So there's, there's tons of stuff you do every year. That's high time consumption and low skill that needs to be delegated, as you said, but delegation comes in many forms, right? Hire somebody, delegate down, systemize it, or potentially use technology. Yeah. Or, I mean, those things all need to be done. Some, some things you may be doing that you could just get rid of. Cause sometimes or we do things erase. Like doing it. Especially if you've been doing something for a lot of years, it's so interesting. I've seen our team this, do this a lot, but it's like, why do you do that still? I don't know. It's just, we've always been doing it that always way. Done it. There, there was a report that one of my assistants was making for me that was saved in Google Drive that I didn't go look for at for like a year and a half. <laughs> <laughs> and she did it every Friday. And she's like, well, you used to like, this is what you needed to like see our numbers at the end of the week. I'm like, I know you needed this, all, Danny. We set it up in our CRM now. Like it's all, it's all automated. She's like, well, I know, but like, I thought maybe you wanted to check it and just make sure it was all accurate. Cause you wanted to do that when we first set it up. And I was like, yeah, for like two weeks, just to like make sure things were, I'm sorry. I forgot to tell you, um, you can stop now. Um, and we can save you two hours a week. So yeah, there's stuff. For sure. And if you don't do that audit, it'll just pile up on you and your team and the efficiency factors start to go down without that yeah. audit. So I like that audit a lot, doing a, a full audit of your role, but then everyone on the team and then figuring out is something being done that shouldn't be done. Is there, Hey, you're doing this task and you're doing that. If, if we actually just have one of you combine, it, it's going to be a lot faster, things like that. Yeah. I will say to back that up, like to do that well, you need to have standardized employment agreements where each role is standardized and everyone knows what they do in the chain of command. Um, you could do it on an Excel sheet and loosely tell people things, but it doesn't stick, stick that well. Um, it's really good when they know what their, their goals are. They know what their deliverables are. They know what, like what their bonus structure is around hitting those goals. And then the tasks come out of all of that. So, um, yeah, anyways, that's a, that's a note that not everybody has in place, but I would encourage everyone like, and we have them free on our website if people want to get them, but like get some employment agreements in place. It's usually a good place to start to be able to, you know, create those mechanisms. So, yep. Yeah. I love it. So the, the kinds of partners and customers that you guys have, so the kinds of companies that work with you, you've probably throughout the years noticed certain characteristics or trends or, or the kind of company or person who comes in and just is likely to do extremely well, you know, become mm -hmm. sort of one of the top versus someone who maybe comes in and is likely to struggle a little bit more. Can yeah. you speak to, to some of this? Uh, our coaches actually, if anything, give us a lot of feedback because we're, I'm running also our sales team right now. So we've got our sales team passing off to coaching and we get a lot of feedback for like what's working and what's not. Um, one thing we weed out for even on the sales side is attitude. And it's this like open-mindedness, this curiosity, this willingness to fail, this vulnerability piece that most entrepreneurs, or a lot of entrepreneurs aren't used to having. Even if they want to be vulnerable, they're not used to it because they're kind of like the buck has to always stop with them. So there's don't want to look vulnerable, but being able to do that, it'll open you up to new ways of doing things and new ways of thinking. Um, you can't just force your way into change. It has to be more of a, a delicate process at times. And so openness is massive. And I don't know, just like be less afraid to share. It's a good start. It's like, just say what's really going on. Be real. It's one of our values at BTA is be real. 
And you'll watch as people come with answers and understanding and, and they'll rally around you more than just you against the world. Um, profitability is a thing. It's hard to scale when you're already not making money. And when you think that making money is going to come by doing more revenue, you're sadly mistaken. Um, really watch that. And that there are, a, there are a few instances where revenue does need to increase because you have committed to more overhead in anticipation for growth, which I have seen that. But outside of that scenario, for the most part, you need to get the revenue you are producing to be a profitable part of like what you do and then use that profit to scale up from there. Um, don't do this on credit card debt. Don't go get massive loans from banks, especially painters. You guys do not have complicated businesses that require a ton of seed capital. Um, you can do this off your own dime and you need a profitable business that already works for you to be able to scale it up. It's like, so, a, it's like a, a vehicle. It's like, you got a vehicle that's just burning oil and gasoline. You're like, we'll just dump more oil in it. It'd be great. It's like, no, you're like, you have a fundamental problem. The mechanics of your machine, it probably should be stopped and fixed before we keep moving on, you know, faster on this thing. So yeah, that's a big one. Um, I think the last thing is what we're talking about with delegation, but just like the ability and want willingness to delegate and build a team around you, right? Find people who are better at what they do than you are. And that takes time and training and development, but like be willing to go down that path because what happens is you're, you hire somebody, you're saying, you're going to be the project management. I'm going to step back. It's going to be great. And they screw up and you're like, you can't do this right. You're not doing this. Like I would do this. This is not correct. You're costing me more time and money. I might as well just do this myself. Like you're fired. I'm going to go do this myself again. But what you're missing is the process it takes to develop that person, which is slower and more arduous than taking care of that one thing on Tuesday yourself that you, it's like, yes, I could go just solve that squash that issue in an hour, or I could take like three weeks training that issue so that into that person correctly so that they don't have it. Go the, go the longer route of that three week training because that'll pay you dividends for years as a result. And you have to get used to that way of being with people. Yeah. Uh, entrepreneurship in general, you have to always have that longer time horizon. And it's, it is so tempting if there's a fire or something that just needs to get done you just go do it, knock it out. It's so much slower and more frustrating to then go build the process, figure out why it wasn't done. Make sure you you've covered for everything, train the person on it. It just seems absurdly long, but it gets you out of that role. So ultimately you have to, it, it's a totally different mindset. You're not doing the thing. The thing is your business. The thing is your company. So when you're doing those SOPs or it takes five hours instead of one hour, you are doing the thing because the thing is your company. The thing is not actually the the widget or the fire. You know, it's interesting. Some of the best business owners that I know in painting are really shitty painters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I found they're, that. Yeah. They, they can't do the job that they're supposed they to. They can't do. go plug in or fix it. They can't. So they're yeah. forced to think differently right from the day one. And it creates that way of being right out of the gates. Yeah. They have to find the processes and the people yeah. being able to do it yourself is, is a crutch in some ways. Yeah. It is hundred percent. So one of the, one of the cool things you talked about also at the contract reboot was this idea of 10 X. I kind of like the bash Grant Cardone. I mean, I respect him in a lot of ways, but I also like to bash him. So the, you said, you know, every time you think about 10 X, you said like your blood just runs cold about the operational nightmare yeah. that's being created. Let, let's talk about this idea of, Hey, Grow and I, I'm honestly partially guilty of perpetuating it just from hey, we interview companies doing over a million. You know, it gets people focused on that top line revenue without always necessarily thinking about their business. But let's dive into that. Sure. I mean, I even so I have two other business partners. One of them, um, Igor, who I would say is kind of like our ops leader, and he's incredible with the actual operational complexity and engineering execution of what we do and build every single day. And, you know, it's coming to a point for BTA even where I'm like, hey, man, like we have lots of extra profit. We should use this to grow the business in other ways. And he always reminds me, and I see it too in some of the stuff we're doing. He's like, Danny, you can only deploy so much capital at a time that you can manage properly, effectively into existence a good return. Because mm -hmm. if you just dump money out into the world and hope that it's all going to work out for you, chances are you're just burning extra cash because you can only effectively manage so much change in a given year. And I agree with them. And I've seen this in our business time and time again. And, you know, there's a lot of, it's, it's so, it's very, very counterintuitive to the like North American entrepreneurial story that we're always told, which is outside of painting, but like, you know, in technology, it's like, go get seed capital. People will give you millions of dollars, go burn it, running an unprofitable trade, you know, a technology company for the next five years. And then maybe someone will buy you up and you'll get a big return. It just, it's so, it seems so backwards to me. 
It's very I'm weird. like, no, like learn how to be effective and profitable with what you have. Find your next big opportunity. Take one step into that. Take 20% of your time and step into that one op new opportunity and, and, and prove that it'll yield results. Now build more resources and, and, and allocate more time around that. Um, so we have always grown consistently and we've always grown with a lot of intention. We've never wanted to try and 10x the business because whenever we do, and any, any of the members we work with who have, and they're not 10xing, they're double or tripling within a year, which is a lot. That's a lot to do with a lot, here. Yeah. Um, they're falling apart at the seams. The brand is falling apart. The people are upset. They're not making very much money. They're totally lost and confused about what's actually a priority because they put 20 priorities on their plate in one given year. And like you think about the, the hiring complexity that that brings into place. How are you going to hire great people and spend the time to actually interview and onboard and train those people? You're probably not. You think about the profitability of complexity that puts into place. You don't know what your targets should be for spends and overall profit if you're 10xing in a year because you've never had any experience with a business of that size. Think about the you know marketing complexities and sales pressures that that puts on. It's like you suddenly are bringing that much into the door. Who's selling and booking and bringing in all that work? Who's securing that work in a profitable way? Who's setting proper expectations with all those customers? Like the amount of especially in the brick and mortar businesses of contracting and trades, the amount of operational night fuckery and nightmare that that brings <laughs> is not a good message for our industry. Now, if you've got a funnel where you can online have somebody click and buy a digital product and it's, you know, they're have doing an Amazon drop ship and you've just got to figure out the equation to get more ad spend into, okay, I get that there are arguments for why something simple can be scaled up. That's just the same over and over and over again. But in our industry, we're brick and mortar. We have real people with real job sites, with real physical things we do every single day. Um, scale it, but scale it with intention and time. Time is on a more, more sides. We don't need to do it all in one year. Yeah, the uh, trying to scale, it's a, it's a laborious business, you know, it's labor. So <laughs> trying to scale that quickly is difficult. Yeah, it, and, and every industry has its pros and cons. I, I always call it the great equalizer of, of capitalism, right? Whenever there's a unique opportunity, enough people fill that void that it becomes kind of a similar opportunity to everything else, right? Painters always look at builders and they say, man, look at these guys, they book million dollar jobs. Like imagine I could book a million dollar job, how easy my life would be. And I'm like, you have no idea the operational complexity that goes into building a custom home versus painting, right? And then the, the, the custom home builders, they look at the painters and they're like, man, you make how much profit per job? Man, and like you only have that one thing to take care of every day, <laughs> oh, only right. And I'm like, guys, it's it's a it's a level playing field. We all have different pros and cons to the industries we're in, and we just have to, as entrepreneurs, lean into the things that work and solve the things that don't. And ultimately, it's fine. Like, but I don't think a painting business is built to be 10x in a year. No, I think that's yeah. it can be done. It's probably not smart unless you've done this before and you have all the backing to do it. Yep. Yeah, the grass is always greener on the other side. And the, you know, anytime in my life that I've tried to throw money at a problem, it doesn't solve the problem. So if you're scaling, if you're 10 Xing or, or even two, three Xing, you're, you're having all these fires, all, all, you know, way the operational complexity, you're trying to hire people. The default, like you said, you're probably not making a lot of money. Default is you're going to start throwing money, try to find good people. If you pay them a bunch, if you, if you pose, we'll find a good person, but there's no vetting and just throwing money out into the, into the world doesn't tend to work very well. Yeah, I've heard you said this to me, or it's just this, maybe everyone says it, but it's like, I don't think really money makes more money. It can, but what really powers it is creativity. Creativity and dynamic thinking. And the only reason way to be a really good creative strategic entrepreneur is to have a, enough experience to take yourself to that next step and then get experience there. And then enough experience to take yourself to that next step and then get, you know, solidify the experience there. And I find it incremental. Like I learn more every single year my capacity and my ability to make moves is way more than it was 10 years ago. Um, but I couldn't have gotten there in one year. Yeah. Every year it took that little bit of learning. So. So what, what is the general size of BTA now? How big is your company? Uh, so we do, about, we'll do about 15 million. Well, we just finished 2023, 15 million, um, pushing for about 18 million next year. It gives you an idea of our growth trajectory. Uh, like I said, 47 staff. We have another 13 on the hiring roster for 2024. Um, and yeah, it's that's it's pretty a good big. profitable business. And yeah, yeah, it's a bit so different than pretty... trades. We don't we don't have any variable expenses, but we have a boatload of overhead. <laughs> sure, you guys and, have talent uh, as coaches. And we have everything. talent. We have marketing budgets. We have big technology plays we're play making right now. 
Um, but yeah, I mean, net net, we have a very tight budget. We keep pretty like clear every single month how we did versus our goals on our financials, on our sales, on our on our member retention, all the all the KPIs that matter to us. And um, it's nice, steady growth of usually one to three million a year. That's kind of what we see, and that's what we've been doing since day one. So. Sure. So I I ask about that. I I know well. It's good to give people reference. I knew you guys were around that size, but I think we were we're kind of sold this idea of these sexy startups, right? That's in the news. That that's what's spread. Entrepreneurship is these sexy, explosive startups, you know, tech startup, this and that. Breakthrough Academy is really not a sexy company. It's a company that teaches contractors how to run an effective bit. That doesn't sound like, no, it doesn't. oh my God, that's so sexy, <laughs> right? It's like you're an educational company that yeah. empowers people to run effective Let's contracting. Let's talk business. about Excel sheets today. <laughs> right? Hey. Job descriptions, delegation. <laughs> money, you know, profitability of your company. But I think for 99.9% .9 of entrepreneurs, success should look and feel kind of boring because it's doing the right thing every day over an extended period of time. And then you find success. It's not what you read or see on the news. So if it's, if you're not just exploding, it means you're failing. Don't fall into that trap. You know, it reminds me of, I was, um, so when I was in university, when I was doing this painting thing, I was going to school to be a police officer, actually. So I was studying criminal law and um, I had done what's called the Junior Police Academy. And I remember in my mind, I had this vision of what it meant to be a police officer. I was like, I'm going to be out on the streets. I'm going to be dealing with people. I'm going to be saving Hollywood. Hollywood. <laughs> and then I get in. Gun fights every day, man. I get in and do a ride along with this guy. And he's like, two hours. We did that. It was awesome. And then we sit in his car and fill out paperwork for like another eight. <laughs> and I'm just like what is this? And he's like, you have to document everything that you've done for the day. You have to like, like whatever he's doing. I don't even remember this day. It was like 80% of his job was super boring and nobody ever yeah. talks about it, but it, what's, it's what makes him an excellent police officer that the things he enforces, the things he, the people he incarcerates, the, the tickets he writes, all the stuff that annoy us, but like the things he does in his job, which I wanted at the time, um, is super boring, except for the one little bit that you see on TV. Um, and it's not too different than entrepreneurship. I will say this for me personally. So I, I spend a lot of time planning, looking through things, running sessions, training new employees, doing interviews, like all, all the same stuff that you guys do as you build your business. Um, I kind of like it. So the boring stuff is fun to me. Although other people outside of you know, looking in are kind of like Danny, like my kids are always like, you're just in front of your laptop all day. Like, what are you doing? Um, but I like it. And I found, I found a lot of joy with it. And I would say that to most people that are doing this, like, make sure you like that kind of work. If it, if it just eats you away to be sitting doing this type of stuff, like don't, it, it won't work out well for you. And you're not, if it does, you're not going to be happy with the things you do every single day. Um, there are on, entrepreneurs and a lot of us out there. I'm one of them. It's like, I really like the game to me. It's a giant game of monopoly. Yeah. And um, I like the strategy and the ways it makes me think and the challenges it puts me through. And although it looks like I'm just sitting and typing all day, I'm I'm thinking in a way that makes my mind happy, I guess. I don't know. But um, yeah, entrepreneurship isn't isn't super glamorous. It's not super. There's a lot of a lot of it that you have to just sit in front of a computer and think. Yeah, <laughs> At least it's I a thinking it. man's game. It's a thinking man's game. And I like the way to I like the I like that. I like the thought experiments it puts me through. So, yeah. 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 I like Alex Ramosi a lot, his content and his uh, podcast called The Game because these are the great business leaders and entrepreneurs think of business as a game. So I think it's, mm -hmm. it's a pretty brutal game early on, but it can get really fun if you put the pieces in place. Totally. And I'll say this too to everyone listening. It, it is a brutal game in the context of our North American lifestyle. Mm. And what I mean by that is we already grew up with the genetic we, we grew up blessed we we were born with the genetic lottery already won and if we really look at the rest of the world i'm sure we can all be in agreement with that but what's hard is to actually internalize that and know that um and so there's one thing i always say to myself it's kind of a funny saying but it keeps me sane danny as long as you can eat sleep poop and breathe you're gonna be fine yeah and so things can happen to us where we're like man i'm gonna go bankrupt man i can't pay payroll this month man, I don't know like how we're going to get this job done. This customer's suing me. You know, there, there's, there's hard, stressful things that are and will happen on this journey. Um, but it's okay. You already won the genetic lottery. This is a game. And at some level, even if you 
have the word. Some people, not everyone agrees with me in this, but I'm like, even if you lost your house, you will still have a place to stay. You will still have food. I know it doesn't seem like it will happen that way, but it mostly will. Unless you get into some hard drugs where we see these people in the streets barely getting by. Very few entrepreneurs actually end up there. In fact, none that I've ever met have ever actually ended up to that level of destitution. But our brains tell us that if we don't book this enough work next week to supply for our crews, or if we don't pay payroll, then that's where we're going to go. That's not true. And that's a giant lie. And we have an opportunity here to, to, to feel free, to feel abundance. We have to kind of accept it a little bit too and realize how different we are from the rest of the world. Yeah. And we do, I think those are great points and not to undermine the stress and, or the idea of losing a house, but there are worse things. There are worse places. We tend to have a lot of safety nets here. You know, yeah. there's soup kitchen there. It, it really isn't typically a life or death scenario, not literally. Whereas in other countries or other, other parts of the world, it actually could potentially literally be that dire. Yeah. Um, my buddy says to me, he's like, cause we were talking about this exact topic and he's like, I'm like, cause he's the one who presented it to me. And I'm like, you are so right. Um, he's like, let me give an example. I'm like, sure. We're sitting in a, in a restaurant. He's like, let's just pretend that I stopped talking and I stopped like moving. And I'm like, okay. He's like, <laughs> this is a weird conversation. <laughs> yeah, I know. But he wants to prove how much like, yeah, I think okay. everyone listening, listening, I think everyone listening can see why you and I had the weird conversation. Yeah, I mean, who was prompting this? <laughs> um, and he's like, why? I'm like, okay, so. Sure. He's like, what happens next? And I'm like, well, I probably eventually leave because you're being boring and I pay my bill and go he's like, okay, cool. He's like, what happens next? And I was like, I guess the restaurant would ask you to leave because you're not moving and you know, they'd be a little weird out by this whole thing. You're scaring and, people. Yeah. And he's like, okay, cool. Then what happens? He's like, I guess they call the cops to like remove you. And he's like, okay. And I'm still not moving. I'm still not doing anything. I'm not responding. Nothing. They probably put you in a mental institution or something because you're not something's wrong with you and he's like "Uh uh-huh and i'm like he's like and then what and i'm like i don't know man you just be there and he's like exactly he's like they they have given me a place to stay they'd feed me they'd give me water i I would stay alive and i don't even have to move or talk that's how blessed we are in this this society we live in i was like weird but really good point <laughs> so that was a weird um, way to get there. I like it. It's a weird way to get there, but it's it's it, like I it still sticks in my brain because I'm like, right, like we overcomplicate this whole survival thing way too much. That yeah. is the reality. Like we 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 have abundance here to the point where we'll take somebody who doesn't speak or, or move and take care of them. Yeah. That's a heck of an example that your buddy can <laughs> Yep. So so uh Getting slightly back back to more tangible here for a second. For people who who join P- BTA, I guess what could they expect from you guys? This is your opportunity to get a, a little more granular yeah. about what you guys do. I mean, I mean, sure, you want granularity. I mean, expect to set a budget with us, set up sales and production plans, expect to know your numbers, expect to track your numbers and be forced to do it every single week where we do a review. Expect to have an organizational structure, job descriptions in place, recruiting process in place, be skilled up in the skill of interviewing and hiring. Expect to have complete standard operating procedures. We actually are just, we just finished the painting ones, but we have complete playbooks for you done. So you can take our playbooks and work off of those. Um, Expect to have a good sales plan in place. Expect to have a good marketing plan in place. Expect to have a good strategic plan, like a business plan in place. Um, Yeah, like all the fundamental components of your business are already built. We built them. And then we give them to you and then we slowly train them into existence with you. So you and your company knows how to use them every single day. Um, Questions will stop. You'll stop wondering what's the right answer. You'll now know what the right answer is. And the only thing left is for you to actually commit to those answers and go take the action required. Um, All our members say this, like you you get what you put into BTA. Like the more you put into this, the more you'll get out. Everyone knows that general way of life. Um, But it's very true here. Um, it is all here for you on a silver platter, but you still got to do the work once you take it off that plate and move it into your organization. Yeah, I love it. So it's set up to succeed. And who, for people listening who think they may be interested in exploring a partnership with BTA, who do you best serve? How? What kinds of companies do you typically work with? Is there a revenue level or how do you look at yeah. this? Yeah, we have three different tiers. So like the range is relatively large. I'd say painting would be like 500,000 to 15 million, but we have three different tiers. So like, the 500,000 to million dollar guys, we have a program for them. 
the million to like $5 million guys, we have a program for them. And the 5 million to 10 million, we have a program for them. And we kind of like put people in three different lanes. And um, yeah, that would be like revenue size, usually like highly entrepreneurial owner, stepping out of the day-to-day -day or working on it. Um, very interested in, in development and growth of their organization. Does not have to all be about revenue line growth. It's just, I want to grow this business to be more of a, an organization than just me running it. Yeah. And really does need, I'd say five hours a week to work on the business. And it can't be a pipe dream to be able to do that because we need that time with you to be able to make this change. Um, and willing to get along with other entre entrepreneurs and contractors. There's a lot of sharing going on, group work, stuff like that, where you have to kind of willing to show everyone your stuff. There's my good and the bad of who I am. And, you know, listen and take advantage of what you see in other businesses, but also be willing to share with what's going on in yours. So there's, there's done for you. There's do it yourself. And there's done with you. This sounds very much like a done with you. Done with you. hundred percent. Yeah. Good. Danny, this has been awesome, man. Is there anything yeah, else that you, you want to add anything else we should discuss before we wrap this up? No, just like, don't go try and reinvent the wheel. Like we've already figured it out. Um, coming off our conference, like I'm pretty just blown away and empowered by what we've done. And I'm kind of like, man, I really think we're onto something here. And I don't want everybody. Fif to 15 million, 18 million. I think, I think we're starting yeah. to get onto something here. We're starting to get onto something. <laughs> Um, and it's funny because it does, it is a big number, but it feels like we're just beginning. Like it sure. still feels that way. I still feel like we're just on the start of what we have in the front awesome. of us. Um, and yeah, like just everyone out there, I'm like, just if you're growing your business and you're in painting and you're like at this place where all this stuff needs to be done, um, we built it. Just don't be too stubborn here. Like just, you, we probably, we probably should help you. Like a lot of work has gone into this and it's a lot easier now to pass that to somebody else than having somebody created from scratch. And so, yeah. How can they, us. how can they get in contact with you guys or apply to work with you guys? I mean, the easiest way is our website, btacademy.com. So B-T-A-C-A-D-E-M-Y.com. Uh, we have a podcast. If you want to look us up, Contractor Evolution. So you can read that and see that anywhere you'd like. We have a weekly publication that goes out and, um, yeah, I don't know. You can Google me if you like. I'm not, you probably won't see me and meet me right away. I've got a large company here, but um, as far as like, yeah, if you want to reach out through LinkedIn or through, you know, Facebook, if you find me on there, feel free. I'm happy to reply back and answer any questions you have. So, yeah. I love it. Danny, appreciate your time, brother. Good connecting again, man. Thank you. Awesome, Brandon. Yeah. Talk to you later. If you want to learn more about the topics we discussed in this podcast and how you can use them to grow your painting business, Visit paintermarketingpros.com forward slash podcast for free training, as well as the ability to schedule a personalized strategy session for your painting company. Again, that URL is paintermarketingpros.com forward slash podcast. Hey there, painting company owners. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Give us your feedback. Let us know how we did. And also, if you're interested in taking your painting business to the next level, make sure you visit the Painter Marketing Pros website at paintermarketingpros.com to learn more about our services. You can also reach out to me directly by emailing me at brandon at paintermarketingpros.com and I can give you personalized advice on growing your painting business. Until next time, keep growing.